Hey everybody, it's Justin with Bad Zero Games, and today we're going to do an overview of San Juan. So I've set this game up, not for any particular number of players, but it does play from 2 to 4. And it takes usually about 30 minutes, 45 minutes, depending on um, the familiarity of your, of your players. This game is essentially a race game with a hand management aspect to it. You start out with um, an indigo plant. If you've played Puerto Rico, you'll, you'll recognize the the art and the theme, which is sort of old world, um, you know, merchants and things like that. Uh, there's two types of card that you're going to get in your hand. Uh, you've got a production card, which will have a, a color background, sort of um, the same as what it is. So for example, this is an indigo plant. And during the production phase, this allows me to produce an indigo, which I can later sell. Each card has a cost. So the cost of the card what it is, what it does, and how many victory points you get at the end of the game. And the game is basically played until somebody uh, gets their 12th uh, building. Each round, you're going to be able to choose between five different phases or five different actions, um, which I'll cover in just a minute. And you use those various actions to do things like build new buildings, um, get new cards, um, produce goods, trade those goods, and in many cases you might just need money. And the cool thing about this game uh, and other games like Race for the Galaxy, for example, which these have very similar mechanics, is that San Juan, in this game, the card itself is your currency. So you're dealt a hand of four cards, each with a, a cost. So, for example, the tobacco storage would cost me three to build gives me two victory points, and tobacco, when we trade, is actually worth more than indigo. But do I want to build this, or do I want to build the, the sugar mill, which is only two cost, one victory point, also can be worth more than indigo to trade. Um, and that's, that's really where the decision making comes in, because in order for me to build one of these cards, I have to spend the other cards to do so. So if I wanted to build a card here, the building phase would have to be chosen. And I'll go over the phases more in just a minute, but I wanted to give you an example. I choose a card, for example, let's say I wanna pay three for the tobacco storage because I wanna be able to produce more and sell more. Then I would put this in my, in my tableau, for, for example, but then I have to spend these three cards to get, to get it. So, you know, there's this great sort of checks and balances like, oh, do I, do, you know, do I spend the cards now? Do I wait? Do I wait for somebody else to take, to take one of the actions? Um, it's a really great, you know, I wouldn't say it's a brain burner, but, but I really love that sort of, you know, mental challenge that it gives you. Um, and once you get to know the cards a little bit better, that'll help make that decision a little easier. So let's go through, through, um, each of the phases in a round. And the way it works is every round, somebody is gonna be the governor. And this is essentially first player. So their job is to remind owners of the office, buildings, banks, and chapel of, uh, of their building functions. So basically at the beginning of each round, there's a couple things that you wanna remind people to do. If you have a chapel, for example, you can take a card out of your hand and put it underneath the chapel. And then that card at the end of the game will be worth victory points. So if you get it early on, you could get, you know, 8, 10, 12 victory points. And again, this game, you, you, you win um, by adding up the victory points at the bottom of the card, but the person who builds 12 first, at the end of that building phase, that's when the game ends. You don't go on to the next phase. So, you know, everybody gets a chance to build um, through the same phase. So, again, um, each round you're going you're gonna to choose a role, and then everybody gets to do that role, but the person who chose it is gonna get a special privilege specific to that role. And so we'll go over them really quickly. Again, governor, um, your first player, you get to choose the first role, and uh, you, you just make, remind people, hey, by the way, don't forget to do this, don't forget to, you have to discard down to a certain number of cards or something like that. All right, so the builder. The action for building is to take one card out of your hand and build it, and you would pay um, for that building with other cards out of your hand. But however, if you choose the builder action, you get to pay one less card. So a three cost building would only cost you two cards. So it's beneficial to take this if you want to build. Everybody gets to build, but you get the privilege of paying one less. The counselor. Remember that cards in your hand not only are stuff for you to build, but they're money. This is your, this is your currency. So this, uh, 
This phase, the counselor action, allows you to draw two cards and keep one. Your privilege as the counselor, however, is that you get to draw an additional three cards. So you get to draw five cards and keep one. So if you're looking for a specific card, so let's say I take this action and I'm looking for something really specific. In this case, I got a horrible hand of all five silver smelters, which are all really expensive. Uh, but I did get a bank. And uh, so maybe I'm not looking for the bank, uh, but I get to keep one of these. So I would probably keep the, ba keep the bank because silver smel smelters are great for when you're doing a lot of production and you, you're gonna get a good amount of money for this when you produce a good, but maybe I'll use this instead. So, you know, take one, discard the rest. Um, everybody else would get to draw two and keep one. So that's really what the purpose of, the purpose of that role is, is to get more cards into your hand. Uh, the producer. So on your turn, if you have a production building, which everybody starts with indigo, you can produce one good. And the way this action works is you just take a card off the top of the deck without even looking at it, and it tells you to put it on top. I always put them underneath so I can remember what you know the power of the building is because there's a couple of city buildings, um, and this is a production building, and then you have city buildings. And the production buildings, again, they have the color of the background of, of what they produce. A city building always has a beige color, and it'll usually be a market, or like I said, showed you the earlier the bank or something like that. So anyway, um, it'll, for example, some of them allow you, uh, during the counseling phase, as a matter of fact, to take a card and put it underneath here. Not the black market, but there's another card. You put it underneath, and it's a good that you can sell during the trader phase, which I'll go over in just a minute. So anyway, I always put them underneath. Um, makes it easier to keep track of stuff. Um, the nice thing about, again, taking the producer as your action is you can produce more than one good. You can produce one additional good. Um, not per uh, production plant. Um, you can only ever have one, but if I had, let's just say I did have the tobacco storage. Because I took the producer action, I could produce a good under tobacco as well. If I didn't have this, but I did have the ability to produce, I would only get to produce in one location. Now the trader. The trader is is used to sell one good. And again, if you are the if you take the privilege, or rather if you take the trader and you get the privilege of trading, you can sell additional goods. So I would then what I would do is this little stack of, of cards is our markets, and they they fluctuate. So when I took the trader, I would flip over one of these cards, and it's gonna give me a different price for each good. So indigo is always one. Sugar can be one or two. This is tobacco, this is coffee, and this is silver. And if we look at the varying um, markets, we'll see that some of the, there is some fluctuation on them. So that there's a little bit of a luck of the draw. So in this particular case, I'm able to sell indigo for one. So I would draw one card and discard the indigo. And because I took the action of trader, I could sell my tobacco for two. So I would discard this and take two. So now I have three more cards in my hand. Let's just take a look at what I got. Lots of production. Somebody didn't shuffle this deck very well. But, um, you know, and again, like let's say maybe now I'm like, oh, you know what, I'm gonna build this guy. So on the next round, I might take the builder so that I can build this, and then I get one cost less, right? Because the builder gives you the ability to spend one less, and then I could buy this guy for four. So there's definitely privileges, and definitely knowing when to use something. Because obviously you can look at everybody's tableau. This is, this is open for everybody to see. So I might be thinking to myself, you know, I bet my opponent, he's probably gonna either produce, because he's got a lot of production stuff and nothing underneath him, or he might just build. You know, so you can determine when you take a role versus somebody else taking a role. So trader, trader works with the market. You can sell two goods, everybody else can sell one good. And there's cards that work with each one of these. So for example, there's a card that allows you to discard goods to make your buildings cheaper to purchase, etc. Finally, we've got the prospector. There's no action that the prospector gets. His only privilege is he gets to draw one card. So he gets a buck, basically. So after you go through several rounds, um, you're going to start to build a tableau of cards where you'll have various goods and various city cards that give you special abilities and powers, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll be producing and, and selling and, and hopefully buying stuff. Um, and then once somebody gets to 12, they've built their 12th building, 
Um, at the end of that round, or the end of the builder phase for that round, the game ends and you calculate victory points. In this copy of San Juan that we have in our game library, it also comes with a mini expansion that has the cathedral. So during the building phase, you can, instead of building one of your cards in hand, you can build a cathedral for seven cards. And that person who owns this gets four, seven, nine, or ten victory points for one, two, three, four opponents who own six cost buildings. And remember I said each of these buildings has a cost. So the black market is two, the coffee roaster is four. There's some special buildings that are six point, and the six points have variable victory point conditions at the end of the game. And so if you can build this guy, he's going to be beneficial if other people are building the six point card costs. In a way, it's kind of like if you've ever played Seven Wonders, it's kind of like the guild cards at the end in the third age of Seven Wonders that you'll get paid for cards in your opponent's hands and stuff. So that's kind of cool. So just to, to go over a couple of the cards that you'll see um, and some stuff that I find really interesting. So if you could build the guild hall, that's a six point card. You're going to get one additional victory point for each production building and one victory point for each type of production building. So these are production buildings, anything with, uh, that says plant usually, or in this case tobacco storage. Um, so let's say I, I was able to build this, I was lucky enough to be able to build this. I would get three victory points, one for each, but then I'd also get one for each different type, and I have three different types. Actually, I have four, so I would get eight victory points just for this. I don't get the six, I just get the eight, okay? The tower. The base rules for hand management in this game is you're going to start with four cards, but you can, you can carry or hold up to seven. So at the beginning of each round, whomever the new governor is going to be is going to remind people to discard down to seven cards. But if you have the tower, you can keep 12. And there's a guard post, I believe, or I think it's a guard tower guard post that requires everybody to discard down to six. So this is a good card to keep if you've got somebody that's you know, making you discard. The library, this is one of my favorite, favorite buildings to get. It doubles the privilege for every role selected. So what that means is if I chose the producer, I could sell three goods because my initial action is I can sell one good, but my privilege is I can sell an additional, so it doubles this, so it would give me three. The only time this card gets confusing, and we worked it out in our, in our many playthroughs, is with the counselor. In the rule book, it actually describes this particular usage in that when you're taking the counselor action, the, the action is to draw two cards, so you do that. Then you, as the person who took it, you get the privilege of drawing three more cards. So you would think, oh, well, then I get to double and draw ten. But you're actually doubling this privilege. Three and three, eight is really your total. So three and three plus the two is eight. That's how many cards you get to draw. Uh, it gives you a little bit more variation. So you can really go through the deck and, you know, be looking for specific cards. Like maybe you're looking for, maybe you're looking for the library. Uh, or, you know, if you didn't have it, obviously. Um, and then I showed you this before, the black market. Black market, when you do the builder phase, it allows you to discard goods that would be under your production cards to make the buildings cost less. So if you took the builder phase and you had this card and you had stuff underneath that you could trade, you could discard these. You could literally build this for two cards. So lots of ways to use the various phases. Um, great game, really fun, fairly quick once you get used to the, the flow of the game. There's just enough interaction between people but I think the funnest part is the race. Like, you know, there's going to be towards the mid game where, you know, your opponent's got eight or nine cards and you're like, oh, do I build or do I sell? Um, so, um, comes with a great little score sheet. Though, in our demo copy, I've laminated this and I recommend doing this. Um, you know, if you have a scanner or, which most of you have access to, I would think, um, you know, scan this and then blow it up and then, um, you know, I, I laminate them with a, I bought like a really inexpensive laminator and uh, I think it was like 20 bucks. And then the, the lamination sheets are really inexpensive. And it works great with, a, with a, uh, a dry erase marker. So we'll, you know, we'll put our names in here and we'll do our scores. And then when we're done and we've lamented our defeats, we just clean it off. It makes it great for demo libraries because I can put it in the box and then you won't burn through these. Though if you just bought a copy of this game and you didn't want to go through that whole process, there's several score sheets, and it's double-sided. And of course, you could always copy this. And I'm pretty sure you can buy this online if you were looking for it. So in any event, that's San Juan. It's a really fun game, really simple. It reminds me of 
and it has a very similar mechanic to Race for the Galaxy um, and a little bit of Seven Wonders, be but there's no drafting mechanic in this game. So I'm not going to take my cards, my hand of four cards, let's say, and then trade them to, you know, take one and pass it on to the next person. So hopefully you've enjoyed this. Let us know. Um, and we'd look forward to seeing you out on a game day. You can check us out at uh, badzerogames.com or facebook.com forward slash badzerogames and uh, let us know what you think. Have a great day. Thanks.